Singapore Cinema Corporation presents your own Astra Gazette. In the world of painting, who doesn't recognize the National Gallery in London, or just as famous, the Tate? Fine buildings that symbolize the great traditions that have come to be associated with paintbrush and canvas. Today, there are many schools of art, using the word in the loose sense, but now we bring you something really different. Introducing the artist William Green, a student of the Royal College of Art, and his style, action painting. You'll see why in a moment. that for this school of painting, one needs a bicycle, preferably one with flat tires. However, don't be discouraged if you can't afford a bike or can't borrow one. A similar effect can be got with, say, a pair of roller skates. Don't, and we repeat, don't, go in for anything as heavy as a car. By the way, William, who does this work in his spare time, is following in the footsteps of an American, James Pollock, who developed action painting ten years ago when he accidentally spilt a pot of paint on his canvas and liked it. The materials used by William are, in place of canvas, a sheet of hardboard already painted white, and in place of paint, a mixture of black bitumen and paraffin. To this medium is added sand and gravel for added texture. On occasions, he even sets fire to it before completion to heighten the effect. Despite widespread criticism, Mr. Green feels his work is the future of art. In his words, the value of the painting depends entirely on its surface, variations of lines, contrast of materials, and density. He admits that some people will never appreciate it. And by the way, its value in financial terms is about a hundred pounds. Ah well, art, you know. To see a perfect army in miniature, we visit the Kensington home of film actor Peter Cushing. For in his spare time, Peter, an enthusiastic member of the Model Soldier Society, collects, makes and acts as general to an army over 5,000 strong. These troops, from every period of military history, are the result of meticulous research into uniforms and military techniques. Cushing often links hobby and film career, portraying military leaders in films like The Black Knight and Alexander the Great, and then creating in miniature the armies of these historical characters. Many of these tiny replicas are made from compressed drawing paper, delicately hand-painted and with detachable swords and helmets. Surrounded by these miniature masterpieces, Cushing is not content to just sit and admire them. He plays with them. He plays with them solemnly and conscientiously, according to the rules laid down by H.G. Wells in his famous book, Little Wars. The title is described as a game for boys from 12 to 150, and for that more intelligent sort of girl who likes boys' games and books. In fact, the game has been and is played most soberly by distinguished people. It's said that Napoleon was an enthusiast. Played rather like a game of chess, but more exciting, the battle area is first laid out to the player's specifications. And then in turn, artillery, cavalry and infantry clash, or take evasive action, according to the player's generalship and spirit. Altogether a fascinating test of ingenuity, and more important, good marksmanship by the gunners firing their toy shells. Proving, if we needed proof, that playing soldiers is one game we never grow out of. At the well-known Brands Hatch Motor Racing Circuit in Kent, we find a new school for racing drivers run by John Cooper. 
More than 5,000 enthusiasts have applied to enroll since the nursery scheme was announced, and pupils are split into small groups for lectures, at which instructors like Ron Searles explain some of the basic rules. A good driver has to know his engine, and John explains the intricacies of a 1500cc sports car for the benefit of pupils that include a few promising women drivers. Pupil Arthur Malloch, an army major and an amateur racer, comes in for some personal coaching from John Cooper under fairly normal racing conditions. The idea of the school, by the way, is to find and train exceptional drivers for the works team. But to give you some indication of the high standard set, 1,000 of these successful applicants will be tested in a year in the hope of finding only a few. After instruction, Malak goes solo in a Formula 2 model, instinctively putting into practice one or two racing habits. Notice, for example, that he tucks his trousers into his socks to prevent them fouling the pedals inside the car. Drivers also wear light canvas shoes because the controls are far more sensitive than in a normal car. The odds against reaching the top are high. But remember that Sterling Moss and Peter Collins are among the top flight names who started racing in little half-litre cars. Without doubt, the school presents a heaven-sent opportunity of recapturing these success stories. A quick visit to Netheraven in Wiltshire to watch the start of a new life in the services for 14-month-old Alsatian Tess. For this is where thoroughbreds like Tess, no longer wanted by their owners, either because of a move from the country to a flat in town, or because they're becoming too expensive to keep, are handed over to the RAF. So now let's introduce some of these dogs and the people who look after them from now on, kennel maids of the Women's Royal Air Force. On joining the RAF, each dog is given a thorough medical overhaul and given its own service number. From then on, all medical treatment is supervised by a veterinary surgeon, although the kennel maids are taught first aid and are obliged, for their own sakes, to spend some of their time in the dispensary. The docile patient, by the way, is six-year-old Patsy. The girls, all of them volunteers incidentally, must obviously have a love of animals and a natural aptitude for handling dogs. To these qualifications is added the specialised knowledge and experience acquired in an intensive four weeks training course. Care and affection. Wholesome food, each dog gets a daily ration of two and a half pounds of meat alone and plenty of exercise and their previous owners probably wouldn't recognize them. They're kept together like this, in fact, for a basic training period of six weeks, after which every dog is given a personal handler who will continue its education. Because of their love of the life, some of the girls take jobs as kennel maids when they leave the Women's Royal Air Force but the dogs have, in most cases, signed on for life. Trained for police work with security units, about 50% are posted to RAF establishments overseas and most probably stay there because of quarantine regulations. Like most youngsters, this is the part the trainee dogs like best, and you have to admit they do it well.
If the dogs fulfill just part of their promise, you can be sure they'll do a fine job whatever their destination. A tribute to the devotion and skill of the kennel maids of the Women's Royal Air Force.